Okay, hello. Um, uh, today is the 4th of uh, February 2023, and we'll talk about two architects. Although Yanis Xenakis was, was not just an architect, but also a, a, a formidable uh, composer of avant-garde music, uh, if we call it so, if we can call it so. So we begin with Yanis, with Yanis Xenakis born in 1922, and he died uh, uh, 22 years ago. Uh, let's read a little bit about him. First, let's look at a picture by him. Most pictures of him show his uh, right side of his face, because the left side was um, uh, badly um, damaged by some traumatic event and I, during the Second World War, I think. In, in, but I don't know. I, I, I never read about what happened to his other side of his face. Anyway, let's read Yanis Xenakis, also spelled Yanis with a Y, um, born in May 29th of May 1922 and died, as I said, on the 4th of February 2001, was a Greek French composer, music theorist, architect, performance director, and engineer. Uh, personally, I regret that uh, those the first 10 years of his life are not mentioned here, which would have qualified him to be also considered a Romanian, Greek, French, and so on. But on, on some other sources of, um, you know, information, um, there is more justice than, than here. But this I took from the um, English language uh, Wikipedia. But you cannot ignore really where someone is born and not just born, you know, in a day or a week, but, but who lived for 10 years in Braila, in Romania. Anyway, after 1947, uh, he fled Greece. So he was uh, uh, 20, 25 years old when he fled Greece, becoming a naturalized citizen of France. Xenakis pioneered the use of mathematical models in music, such as applications of set theory, stochastic processes, and game theory, and was also an important influence on the development of electronic and computer music. He integrated music with architecture, designing music for pre-existing spaces, and designing spaces to be integrated with specific music compositions and performance. Uh, among his most important works are Metastasis, 1953-1954 for orchestra, which introduced independent parts for every musician of the orchestra. Percussion, percussion, percussion works such as uh, Psafa, 1975 and Pleiad, 1979. Compositions that introduced specializations by dispersing musicians among the audience, such as Ter Tektorch, electronic works created using Xenakis UPIC system, and the massive multi multimedia performances Xenakis called Polytop, that were a summa of his interests and skills. Among the numerous theoretical writings he authored, the book Formalized Music, Thought and Mathematics in Composition, uh, French edition 1963, Eng English translation 1971, is regarded as one of his most important. As an architect, Xenakis is primarily known for his early work on the Le Corbusier, the Saint-Marie de la Tourette, on which the two architects collaborated and the Philips Pavilion at Expo 58, which Xenakis designed by himself. So you see, the, the building house picture is on the cover of a massive book on 100 years of modern architecture, represents a building designed by Xenakis. And it is acknowledged even in this uh, uh, text on Wikipedia. Now, <laughs> This is the man receiving the highest honors of uh, France. You know, he was a knighted. He became a chevalier, uh, a knight of the uh, uh, Legion d'Honneur. I mean, 
you know, we are talking here about a very accomplished man. But this very accomplished man went through a very dark and troubled period in his life, and we are going to read a little bit about it uh, next. So born of Greek parents, Yanis Xenakis left Romania for Greece at the age of 10, where he continued his scientific um, know, scientific uh, studies, I guess, graduated from the Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, in, I don't know why it's in French, Ecole Polytechnique in Greece, but anyway, 1940, 1947. So he was a student when he was involved in <laughs> so-called uh, terrorist activities and musical studies, notably with the Russian composer Aristotle Kondorov. Resistant from the start, this actually, I have to tell you, and now I understand why Ecole Polytechnique is in French. I translated this from a French website, which had a text in French, because here is a word which I didn't know what it meant, and it's in French, and but I, 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 I arrived at understanding what it means. Resistant from the start. This is an automated Google translation from uh, French into English. What is meant? He was uh, fighting in the resistance, having experienced the Maquis, prison, internment camps, torture, sentenced to death by the regime for political reasons and as a terrorist, he managed to reach France, where he obtained nationality in 1965. Now, this is a very interesting word and what it meant in, 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 in France, in, in French history. Uh, Maquis is, a, uh, that's what I read, is a resistant fighter from a kind of a guerrilla, a guerrilla fighter. So this man went, when he was a student, indeed through a very, you know, troubling uh, period. But he fought for, 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 for truth, he fought for justice, he fought against, against fascism, against uh, the injustices of, uh, of the government of Greece at that time. I, I, I'm not very familiar with the details of the possible collaboration between Greece and, and, and Germany, but certainly something because he was a student between 1940 and 1947. And, um, uh, I, I, I imagine he fought for the right reasons, and uh, he, he, he did so uh, in dramatic terms, uh, since he was, uh, as you can see, imprisoned, uh, you know, uh, uh, camps, uh, torture, sentenced to death, and so on. He was able to escape, but if I remember correctly, I think something happened to his father and his brother. He was able to leave. Now, we continue, as an architect and from his arrival in France, Yanis Xenakis was for 12 years, one of Le Corbusier's closest collaborators for technique as well as for aesthetics. Why for technique? Because he was trained as an engineer. He was not trained as an architect. He studied music as we read above and he studied uh, engineering, but not architecture. Now, this is very interesting. How come Le Corbusier hired him? And in a light mode, and uh, I'm, I'm probably wrong, but I imagine that uh, Le Corbusier has some kind of a sympathy for him because you probably know, because I, I, said, it, uh, I said it several times, Le Corbusier ha also had troubles with one eye. Le Corbusier, since he was 28, he only had a working, eye and that was i think his left eye because something happened apparently that's what i read he was painting one night and he lost his sight in his right eye i think while um, xenakis uh, had uh, the same problem but on his left eye so uh, i don't know I don't know, something that you uh, try, to, try to understand. This man probably didn't have an architectural portfolio. He never studied architecture. But Le Corbusier hired him. And not only that he hired him, he entrusted him and he, and, and, and he was, Xenakis was one of the closest collaborators of Le Corbusier for 12 years. This is not a little thing at all. Anyway, at the same time, 
If in 1948, Nadia Boulanger and Arthur Honegger refuse him entry to the composition class, because obviously um, Yanis Xenakis continued to have high interest in music, Darius Milho, I don't know who this person is, gave him some advice and Xenakis followed Olivier Messiaen's class of analysis and musical aesthetics for two years at the conservatory. And the courses of Hermann Scherren and Grabeson. Anyway, these, these people are, you know, from the field of music. Inventor of the concept of musical masses, stochastic music and symbolic music by introducing the calculation of probabilities and the theory of sets in the composition of instrumental, electroacoustic and computer music, Yanis Xenakis is also the inventor of several compositional techniques constituting the lingua franca of the avant-garde. But he did so with a significant time before the arrival of our digital age. This must be considered. His particularly rich work is performed in all the major cities of the world, devoting festivals and symposiums to him. Many times rewarded, his approach earned him to be invited as a visiting professor in the largest universities in the world, that is for, for music. And these are four, uh, you know, uh, appreciations coming from France, uh, you know, great, uh, great appreciations. Knight of the Legion of Honor, Officer of Arts and Letters, Officer of the Legion d'Honneur, Legion of Honor, Commander of the National Order of Merit. I find this very inspiring and very moving. I mean, a man who as a student was, the, was on the blacklist of Greece, who lost his mother, who lost his sister, who had all kinds of troubles. He was almost killed. He was condemned to death. He arrives in France, the country of culture par excellence, no? in the city of lights. And he receives these awards and he acted at the highest level, not just in architecture, but also in music, not just in music, but also in architecture. I think it is formidable. Now, this is the, this is the website that I took that the previous text from, and I translated it from French into English through Google automation. And we know that those translations are not perfect, uh, far from it, but we, we got a certain idea about um, Yanis Xenakis. Now here he is, uh, I imagine with the other, I don't know, I, I mean, I don't know when this picture was taken. Was he a student at the time or maybe he looks a little more mature? Um, I saw that it was a picture from, uh, I mean, is that Greece? It might be Greece. Um, anyway, a very interesting man, no? Because again, it wasn't the typical artist who finds refuge in his art, but it was an artist who actually probably took the rifle in his hands and, and, and fought on the streets. Drawings, drawings by Yanis Xenakis. Uh, this is actually, I think, not by him, but I chose this first picture. I'm not sure for what, for what reason. I think because it's symbolic for, for the, uh, the effort to bring through numbers uh, the ambiguities and the, even the lack of clarities that uh, life itself is so full of, you know, because he was using mathematics to uh, create an ineff ineffable uh, music and also to bring uh, musicality, if I can say so, to, to architecture. Some pencil drawings. Uh, he was a dreamer, but he was a dreamer who also used uh, numbers to implement uh, dreams, both in music and in architecture. Like uh, this is a, a, a musical score. Can you believe it? Well, he's, he was not the only one who did this sort of thing. You know, uh, the, the, 
the musical uh, scores of uh, John Cage are equally intriguing uh, graphically. Architecture, you know, coming from a man who never studied architecture. Music, I mean, it is continuous, this dialogue between music and architecture through numbers, but not just numbers, also externalize these numbers in, uh, uh, you know, aesthetical uh, ways. A very interesting man, uh, again, uh, truly a, a genuine creator. But I don't think Le Corbusier would have, would, would have kept in his office for 12 years a man who was not like this. He actually built this uh, polytop in front of uh, Bobourg, in front of uh, uh, Centre Georges Pompidou. Uh, we are going to see it. Now, I don't know exactly what this is, but whatever it is, is I think as beautiful as a, as a drawing by Botticelli. Yannis Xenakis, tribute to Yannis Xenakis. Uh, last year, when was the centennial Yannis Xenakis, uh, there was a big uh, event, uh, a series of events organized by the, you know, the musicians and the societies and institutions of Greece, international, all kinds of international uh, events. He was truly and is truly very, very appreciated. Now, the Philips Pavilion is actually 1958. Sorry, I wrote uh, wrongly there. It's 1958. This is the building that made it to the cover of that huge book that I mentioned, 100 Years of Modern Architecture, and it deserves it. Yes, it was built in the, it was designed in the office of Le Corbusier. He was working for and with Le Corbusier, but as we read, in fact, uh, on Wikipedia, it is said that it was designed by, uh, by him, by Yanis Xenakis. Now, can you imagine in the office of such a productive and creative architect like Le Corbusier to actually design something by yourself? Obviously, uh, Le Corbusier valued him a lot. And it is a remarkable building by all standards because, because it is a, a, a formidable meeting between the measurable and the immeasurable. And you are going to see the plan, and it's so apparent, apparently so irrational, but reason is also implied in the very manner in which uh, numbers are used in order to 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 uh, to create it, to build it. Too bad it was destroyed. I mean, look at this building here, and look at this building here. They have nothing in common. A shaped space and sound building based around the projection of Varese. This was a French composer who, uh, who uh, collaborated with Le Corbusier and Yanis Xenakis for this uh, continuum between architecture and music and space that, that, that uh, happened in this, uh, in this pavilion. Uh, you can find on YouTube actually um, the film that was projected inside the pavilion. And it's a very good thing to, to watch it, I think. It is clear here that he uses mathematics, but, but he, he, uh, he tries to reach the, the unreachable in a way, the, the immeasurable. And so, and this is in a way a very noble, not in a way, it's a very noble attempt. And this, we should do something similar to in our own works. You use the measurable, but through the measurable, you reach for the unmeasurable. Uh, this is, I don't know if this was the, you know, one of the drawings prepared by Xenakis or not. Uh, but uh, it, in my opinion, was the most formidable building in that expo from 1958. This is the man. 
this was the man and you see his left side of his uh, of his face being uh, dramatically uh, you know uh, changed by who knows what happened in those years 1940 1947 music and architecture by Anis Xenakis translated compiled and presented by born in Braila. This is what he said, music is not a language. Any musical piece is akin to a boulder with, with complex forms, with striations and engraved designs atop and within, which man can decipher in a thousand different ways without ever finding the right answer or the best one. Yanis Xenakis. This is the polytop that he built in front of uh, uh, Centre Georges Pompidou. Now, this pavilion, if it was built today, I'm absolutely sure Arch Daily and other uh, e-signs and so on, websites would, 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 would publish it. Well, it was done, I don't know, 60 years ago or something like this. I forgot when Centre Georges Pompidou was built, maybe not 60 years ago, maybe 40, 45 years ago, but nevertheless, to have the, the honor to build your own structure in front of Centre Georges Pompidou is not a little thing at all. And again, Yanis Xenakis did it. Now this picture is probably around that time, 1970, 1968, 1972, around that time. So yeah, around, yeah, 50, 60 years ago. It's very futuristic, is it not? But, but, but this is what happens when you let creativity manifest itself, when you are courageous and you have the means to make it possible. Uh, here we have another picture with the polytop in front of Centre Georges Pompidou. I don't know who those children are, but it doesn't matter. Uh, another picture. I mean, really, this, this pavilion itself is, is remarkable. Besides the works he did for Le Corbusier, this one he did on him, by himself. And you, we know that here on the left uh, is the museum for Constantin Brunkus that Renzo Piano designed. You know, I could almost write something called between Hobbitsa and Braila. Here he is, here he was, here he is. And this is the picture that makes me a little bit uh, both sad and uh, smiling, because this is a picture with Le Corbusier and Yanis Xenakis on the, um, in the railway station in uh, Brussels, probably returning from the meeting with the uh, you know, the, the officials responsible for the expo in 1958, um, perhaps waiting for the train. Let's see, Le Corbusier was probably 1958, or I imagine it was in 1958, this picture taken, or, you know, or 1957. If it was 1958, Le Corbusier was 71 years old because he died in 1965. And, uh, Xenakis in 1958 was 36 years old. And you know, it's both funny and, and sad that these two architects together, they only had two eyes, two fi functioning eyes. Le Corbusier, the left eye, and uh, uh, Xenakis, the right eye. Bravo to Xenakis. And this is a picture on Rue de Sèvres, where Le Corbusier uh, had his office, which was a corridor of a former uh, monastery. This was the, the, the architecture office of Le Corbusier. And on the left, in the foreground, we see Yanis Xenakis, the, the former terrorist in Greece. Uh, and uh, on the right, Le Corbusier. But who is this man here, you know, uh, so frail? 
This is the man who died just a few days ago, uh, B. V. Doshi, the Indian architect who never studied architecture, but founded an architecture school in Ahmedabad and received the Pritzker Prize for Architecture. Now look at this. This man, this man, and this man never studied architecture. This one received the Pritzker. This one is Le Grand Le Corbusier or Le Corbusier Le Grand. And Yanis Xenakis, I think we could add to his name something similar. Yanis Xenakis Le Grand, although maybe he was a modest man. I don't know. I, I seem to see a, a cigarette here. He was smoking. But they had here, you know, uh, architects and engineers. But these three men who made you know, a significant uh, career in architecture and him in music as well. They never studied architecture. What do you make of this? And here they are again uh, studying, uh, you know, for, for Brussels uh, with the Xenakis behind Le Corbusier and I don't know who the other man uh, on the right there is. But you see Le Corbusier almost like a child, you know, and the other men too. And, you know, uh, Xenakis looks at them. But Xenakis apparently designed that, that admirable uh, pavilion. Uh, back to the polytop built later, uh, probably at least 10, 15 years after um, the Philips pavilion. Now, I discovered on the web this sketch. Somebody thought of it. Le Corbusier one circle, Yanis Xenakis another circle, and from their intersections, Notre Dame du Haut at Ronchon. Now, what do you make of this? Uh, clearly, Yanis Xenakis had a, a, an impact in the office of Le Corbusier, and I'm very happy that Le Corbusier was not that egomaniac, not to recognize talent, maybe even genius in someone else. And this is the plan of the Philips Pavilion. It's like an amoeba. It's, 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 you even wonder how could this be, you know, built through numbers with such a fluidity. And at that time, there was no parametric design. There, there were, you know, they, they didn't have the means at our disposal today. Look at this plan. Uh, this we saw. Here he is, you know, experimenting with music. I watched a, a YouTube um, uh, interview with him and he's, he was very firm in asserting that an architect should have another job as well. In other words, to do also something else, not just architecture. And it might be that he is right, that he was right. Because, you know, the incestuous uh, uh, self-involvement with uh, architecture that architects often have doesn't do them any good and doesn't do any good to, to architecture itself. It's, uh, this self-involvement is, um, I would say, very problematic. But to arrive at the level of excellence, Xenakis arrived at, because here it was not that uh, doing music was some kind of a violon d'engre. No, uh, he achieved the highest, uh, you know, results in, 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 the, in the field of musical compositions. Otherwise, he would, he would not have been knighted. He would not have, have received the highest cultural, uh, you know, uh, honors from uh, France. Another picture with him. Later, he got uh, married with a, with a French lady, a, a woman of letter, you know, a, a writer, and they had a daughter who became a painter and something else. Anyway, an artistic family, of course. And this is a scene from inside the Philips Pavilion, uh, from the a fragment, a still uh, image uh, from the film that was projected on the sloping uh, slanted surfaces of the uh, Brussels pavilion 
uh, with a kind of a hybrid create, create, uh, creation, a film uh, to which collaborate, the collaboration uh, happened between Le Corbusier, uh, Varese, and, uh, and uh, Yanis Xenakis. 1958, and look at this building. It looks as futuristic as uh, anything that humanity will build in 300 years, if there will still be humanity on this earth. That is if uh, Putin allows us to continue to breathe on this earth, and others like him, perhaps. Anyway, Xenakis, Philips Pavilion, Brussels, you see, he is considered the, the author of this remarkable building, which again made it to the cover of a massive book on 100 years of modern architecture. And he, there were many great buildings built in modernity, but this building was chosen for, uh, for the cover. Another image from that film, which you can see on YouTube, as I said, and, and, and look at this, you know, they, <laughs> It's 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 difficult to imagine that this was actually measured or measurable and uh, you know buildable, but it was, and it was thanks to the mathematical skills of this former so-called terrorist, condemned to death. No, truly, the more I, I I contemplate his life and work, the more I admire him. I mean, what kind of mentors do we have? Because in a way, the students, and not only the students, anyone is, is some kind of a mirror image of the mentor. Well, what mentors do we have? This man would be a great mentor for any student of architecture and any student of music and any student of, of, of um, you know, uh, enterprise of, of attempting to fight for justice in this world. He risked his life and he almost died. Born and raised in Braila from Greek parents, a remarkable man. I take my hat off in front of him. That's why I keep telling the students, be courageous, be creative, don't follow the mellow path, don't, 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 don't just repeat what other people thought and did. I mean, compare the, 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 the pavilion of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Austria, which is on the left, with the pavilion built for the Philips uh, uh, company, uh, by Le Corbusier and Xenakis, not to say, you know, just Yanis Xenakis. Can you compare them? No, you can't. And we are talking here about the pavilion built up by a country very potent economically with a significant culture in the field of architecture, and very creative. Yet, if you compare these two buildings, the creativity is on the right side of the image, not the left. Great work. Designed by Anis Xenakis, yes. Born in Braila and raised for 10 years in Braila. Apparently his parents were lovers of, uh, of music well, his mom died when, when she gave birth to, to his sister, but I understood they, they went to important concerts, um, you know, outside of Romania, the, his father and his mother. Uh, so you know, there was some, some, some uh, deep appreciation of music in, in their family. Although his father worked for a company, I think some kind of a shipping company, a British shipping company. I think his mother loved music. 
But this is a, <clears throat> a project that was done based on the, on the building that doesn't exist any longer by some, someone, maybe a student. So this is not his, his own uh, uh, project or visualization of the project. During construction, I wonder what these uh, builders felt working on this so-called crazy building. I think we have to think also about the builders. You know, it's not enough to only think about the architect. You know, the architect has to have pleasure in um, creating something unique or whatever. I think it's important that the, the constructors, the builders, the people who actually build it have some satisfaction too. And I think when you contribute to a building that is very creative, you share some of the pride that uh, shouldn't belong just to the architect. And this was the case, this was the case in, in, in the Middle Ages when, you know, uh, people who were not so-called professionals contributed to the building of the cathedrals. And I'm sure they, 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 uh, they uh, you know, were inspired by, by contributing to a building themselves. Plus, at that time, almost everyone was anonymous, like these two people working for this building, um, you know, are anonymous. But I take my hat off in front of them too, because they contributed to erecting this building. Look at the cars and look at the building. <laughs> the cars are clearly from that time, 1958, but the building is from, I don't know, 2085 or 3015 or 400, 4078, uh, it points to the future, the building. Not that I don't like the cars, I do, because I am a nostalgic man, but do you see the, you know, the building transcends the time when it was built, but not the cars. Ah, this is a, you know, a, some kind of a presentation by someone, uh, this uh, Davis uh, Butner, who create, you know, created this collage of images uh, <clears throat> from Xenakis' parabolic perception. And I see even an image from, or several images from Sagrada Familia by Gaudi. All of a sudden, <clears throat> the, the man born in Braila, share space with uh, Antoni Gaudi and uh, <laughs> what, what, what else can we say? There is a, even a quotation there from Yanis Xenakis on the, on, the, on the left side. Here he is, here he was, here he is. Here he is again. He loved music, obviously. We saw this one. Now he was one of the of, of the people who had the intuition of the arrival of the computer uh, uh, with great consequences in uh, for the present. And here he is, maybe in Japan or I don't know somewhere where he is. Uh, explaining to the kids, uh, you know, the, this new technology. Uh, and this, this showed vision, no? He had vision. He understood that, uh, you know, this is, this is what the future will be. And indeed, that future was. Nice. The former terrorist, condemned to death by the Greeks. Now La Tourette Monastery in France, which is a very interesting building. And he was, <clears throat> he was the project architect. Uh, but there are, you know, I visited it two times and I have to say there are the things here that are very intriguing. Like for example, the, these uh, uh, you know, irregular arches in concrete that you wonder why were, 
why were they made in this way? And because here you see columns, you know, uh, like regular columns, vertical. But here, these arches, I hope I have another image. But if I don't have, if you study the building on the web, maybe you'll take a closer look because it's, I, I didn't quite understand <clears throat> why they did it. So, Le Corbusier and Yanis Xenakis. But um, the, here there are, you know, the uh, uh, identified contributions by uh, Xenakis, like, for example, the rhythmicity, the, the musicality of, of, of these uh, uh, vertical divisions here, which separate the corridor that leads to the rooms, the cells of the, of the monks uh, towards the, the, the courtyard. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, no, I, I don't know if, if, if in this particular, uh, uh, I just show a few pictures of La Tourette because it is a great, uh, one, of the, one, one of the most uh, important uh, works by Le Corbusier. Uh, and he was, I should have, I don't know, I, 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 yeah. <clears throat> Here he is, uh, Yanis Xenakis in front of uh, the building, La Tourette. Uh, but I think this picture was taken after he left the office of Le Corbusier because I see he has white, white hair. We are going to see some works built by him also by himself, not with Le Corbusier. But you see here, he could have had um, equidistant between the vertical elements, but they are not. So, and apparently he used some kind of, a, you know, uh, harmonic relationships, you know, based on, on, on uh, uh, calculations. Now, this is not, has nothing to do with, with Xenakis and Orle Corbusier, is the project of Daniel Lipskind, which, which was also inspired by music. As you can see on the left, there are the musical um, scores. Uh, and uh, this is the plan and the model of uh, the, um, the Jewish Museum uh, in, uh, in Berlin by Lipskind, this zigzagging. Uh, uh, the building that he actually built. But I included it in the, in the presentation to show the relationship with the, between music and architecture. And I will show a few other things in this respect a little bit later on. La Tourette, La Tourette. Uh, this is not La Tourette, La Tourette. Uh, if you arrive at La Tourette, which is very close to Lyon in the center of France, you can spend the night. You can actually sleep, rent a room, a cell, a monk cell in the monastery. I did so, and you know, so I slept one night in a in a in a room, um, you know, in the building designed by Le Corbusier. Uh, here is a picture. It's possible that I'm not sure, but this might be might be uh, Xenakis. Here, this is certainly Le Corbusier and uh, the monks contemplating the building. And I wonder why is it that those monks didn't say no to the you know, rather eccentrically modernistic structure that Le Corbusier built for them. This building came into being just like uh, Ronchamp, thanks to a formidable monk, Couturier, I think was his name. He was a, a lover of um, uh, modern art and friend with uh, uh, friends with uh, important uh, modern French uh, uh, artists uh, and friend with Le Corbusier. And he convinced Le Corbusier to build Ronchamp and to build La Tourette because initially, uh, apparently Le Corbusier was not interested because I think Le Corbusier was rather ambivalent to say the least about religion. Actually, this preoccupied me. I did some so-called research. I searched for, I was curious what kind of a spirituality Le Corbusier had. And the closest to an answer was an image I found with a, an interior of a bedroom 
that he had there was above the the headboard of the bed there was a kind of a you know a painting uh, with some religious connotations which was quite eclectic and I think he was close to being an atheist, Le Corbusier. Not totally, but I think he was inclined towards some form of atheism, if there are many forms or several forms. That's why I think he, he was reluctant to accept the commission and the invitation to actually build the Ronchamp and Villa Tourette. Anyway, interesting picture. By the way, I was here, as I said, and, and somewhere around this group of people is uh, where the monks who die are buried. You know, this hill here, they are buried in the close proximity of, uh, of, uh, of uh, this monastery. Uh, uh, this is a villa that uh, Yanis Xenakis built 1966-1977. We remember that uh, Le Corbusier died in 1965. I don't know, maybe he left the, or maybe he left earlier uh, the office of Le Corbusier. I'm talking about Yanis Xenakis. Anyway, he built this villa in Greece. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, like, a, you know, a sum of uh, several pavilions. Uh, I hope I have an image from above. This was built just by Yanis Xenakis without the participation of Le Corbusier, who died in, uh, in, uh, in uh, 1965. I find that the work he did together with Le Corbusier was a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, less predictable perhaps. But this one is interesting too. Uh, and too bad I don't have uh, great pictures of it, but you are going to see a few more. And sorry about the resolution here. Uh, interesting, these cuts in the walls, you know, which could be described as windows, but uh, very cryptical. Uh, this man who was trained as an engineer and who was a you know, resistance fighter and the terrorist, as the Greeks describe him, and uh, the great composer of, uh, you know, avant-garde music, was also an architect who didn't do badly alone either, I would say. And we are going to see also the building, the house he built for himself and his wife and his daughter, their daughter, in the south of France, but this is in Greece. Yanis Xenakis. I hope I have an image from the inside because I did see a picture from the inside. Yes, here it is. Um, what is this? Yes, his own house, built probably in 1996. Uh, he died in, uh, when, in 2011 or 2002, in 2002, I guess. Uh, so with a few years before he died, he built this house for his family, for himself and his family in the south of France. Maybe he was, uh, you know, uh, in a way following on the footsteps of Le Corbusier, 
who built a very different building, Le Cabanon, uh, you know, at, uh, in the south of France too, uh, Cap Martin, and he died while swimming in the Mediterranean Sea. Who knows, it's possible that there is some kind of a dialogue over the years um, between uh, Xenakis and his uh, former, should I say colleague in architecture or master in architecture or friend maybe even. And uh, okay, I will talk a little bit about this also. The only relationship with the presentation as I made is that Kopp Himmelblau built this pavilion, a small opera studio that connects music with architecture. And I thought perhaps it would be interesting to show a work that uh, has some significance in, in this field, the, the marriage between music and architecture uh, built uh, very recently. Uh, the project by Kopp Himmelblau was, was done, uh, inspired by two composers or two musicians, Jimi Hendrix from his piece Purple Maze, Hayes, and Wolf, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart from Don Giovanni. And using uh, computer technology, you know, the, the, the ribs, the pulsations of, of, of music were then translated in apparently um, i'm not very sure how into the into the in, in, into the building mozart and uh, hendrix hendrix and mozart and this is the building the pavilion uh, a building the a pavilion that was supposed to be you know uh, traveling uh, to to um, uh, assemble it and disassemble it and uh, you know uh, a structure that would would would, uh, would not be eternally attached to one place. An interesting and rather aggressive building, uh, but these uh, you know uh, sloping or slanted pyramids uh, were pointing towards the street apparently in order to reject the the, the noise of the cars. But I think it's more to them. It's also you know. <laughs> Uh, kind of, uh, the, you know, epatela bourgeoisie, the very bourgeoisie that paid for the building. But it is indeed a, a structure that uh, shows uh, the meeting between music and architecture. Kopp Himmelblau, Wolf Prix, and his, um, um, you know, collaborators. And la bourgeoisie. Uh, you know, shocked as it might have been, but they don't seem to be very shocked, or they love shock, being shocked. That is possible too. Architecture's provocation. Why not? And I do think that an, a, a, a true artist uh, in modernity, at least, but maybe not only in modernity. Uh, has this devilish role of, um, you know, uh, shocking uh, the bourgeois. I mean, uh, you know, to, to uh, irritate expectations and to provoke a pate la bourgeoisie. Uh, and if I am to think about uh, what, what, uh, um, Xenaki said that an architect should do something else as well. Uh, maybe we could also look at it differently with, uh, with someone who is not an architect, who was not an architect, who built buildings, just like Yanis Xenakis did. He was not an architect and he built buildings. And now I end this presentation with this uh, Votruba church in Vienna, in Vienna, in Austria. A sculptor who did a, uh, I would say, a remarkable church, which was um, uh, is deconstructivist, but his deconstructivism happened, you know, a good number of years before deconstruction arrived in architecture. And this is the building. Yes, and I saw it with students from Bucharest. Uh, it is just as you see it in the picture, and was built by. 
Mr. Votruba, because that's the name of the of the author of the of the of the sculptor who became an architect for this particular uh, uh, particular building, the Votruba Church. The church bears the name of the sculptor who made it. So previously we saw music and architecture. Now we see sculpture and architecture. Uh, and I think the meeting between two fields, emotional fields, no artistic fields, could enrich both. Now I, I don't know what Mozart or uh, Jimi Hendrix might might have thought of the pavilion built by Koch Himmelblau, but I like to imagine that they 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 probably would have liked it, in as much as. Uh, you know, uh, both sculptors and architects uh, like the building by Votruba. You could call these uh, architectural conjunctions or cultural conjunctions or the opposite, cultural disjunctions and uh, architectural disjunctions. One thing is for sure, we are talking about uh, very creative uh, very creative buildings and maybe the creativity derives exactly from you know the coming together of two different arts music and architecture in the case of the pavilion by Kopp Himmelblau sculpture and architecture in the case of Votruba church Epatela bourgeoisie. I like these words. They sound better in, in French than in English. And now we would go to the second presentation today, uh, to the works of an interesting uh, Dutch architect, uh, Piet Kramer, who also died like uh, Yanis Xenakis on the 4th of February. And we pay homage to him as well. And we do it gladly. So Piet Kramer, 1881-1961, a little bit uh, older, if we can say so, than Yanis uh, Xenakis. This was the man. Uh, it was hard to find pictures by him. There are some, but very low resolution. He was a very important member of the School of Amsterdam. But from what I read, uh, when the School of Amsterdam, uh, as an ar architectonic uh, movement, um, fell out of fashion. Um, uh, the archive of his drawings, a large number of his uh, of his projects and drawings, was uh, was uh, destroyed, which is a uh, which is uh, which is something hard to accept. But it happened. But we are going to see his buildings. I usually show at the beginning drawings, but in this case, in his case, as I said. Uh, apparently, th there are no drawings by Pete Kramer left alive. Uh, it's too bad. Let's read a little bit about him. Peter Ludwig uh, Kramer, maybe, you know, Ludovic or Ludwig, I don't know, in, in Dutch, was a Dutch architect. You see, he died on the 4th of February, 1961. One of the most important architects of the Amsterdam School expressionist architecture and i think expressionist architecture deserves to be better known and appreciated because it was a significant uh, presence in modern architecture from 1903 to 1911 uh, so from uh, being 20 to uh, 30 so 10 years he worked in in the architectural practice of edward Kuipers, uh, a famous um, uh, you know name in architecture in, in in the netherlands where he came into contact with the architects johan van der may and michael de klerk michael de klerk i don't know if i pronounce well the name michael uh, should I say Michael? Michael, Michael de Klerk was the leading figure in the Amsterdam School, a remarkable architect. Unfortunately, he died at 40. Uh, but uh, 
they work together. Michael de Klerk worked also by himself, leaving uh, you know a great treasure of, 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 of important buildings. And we are going to see some of them. In 1911, I guess Pete Kramer didn't uh, study architecture. I only see that he worked in, you know, in architecture offices, but didn't. There is no mention about him study, uh, studying architecture in a school. Uh, in 1911, Van der Meer received a commission to design the shipping house, a cooperative building for the six for six Dutch shipping companies. Van der May sought the assistance of his former colleague architects, Pete Kramer and Michael de Klerk, to realize this building. And we are going to see it. Uh, this is the ship house. That's how it is called, the shipping house. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot, it's my limit, one of my limits, one of my, my many limits. I cannot read in Dutch. I, I, I am crippled. It's considered the starting point of the Amsterdam School movement. Later, Pete Kramer collaborated with Michel de Klerk on the well-known uh, the, the housing project in Amsterdam South 1919-1923. Outside Amsterdam, he built one of his masterpieces, the uh, store in, in The Hague, 1924-1926. After the death of Michel de Klerk in 1923, Piet Kramer was the leading architect of the Amsterdam School until the end of this movement at the beginning of the 1930s. So let's see first this uh, shipping house, 1913, uh, 1916. He was still a young man, and I don't know how he got this commission, but he did. I saw this building, and it's remarkable, you know. Uh, it, I mean, you know. <laughs> You wonder how how did people build in this way at that time? It's almost like a cathedral. I mean, if you see the hallway, the entrance hallway in this building is is uh, it's cathedral like. And uh, the facade is so rich. Look at the brickwork, you know the the woven brickwork and the details. And it's look at what's there at the top. I mean, somebody did the drawings, other people built it. This is architecture at its best, is is uh, is uh, craft and art together. There is exaltation here, that exaltation that Frank Lo that uh, Walter Gropius uh, advocated uh, uh, in order to transform uh, the craftsman into an artist. Here, the craftsmen became an artist. Why? Because they were exalted. Why were they exalted? I don't know. It was a commercial building, you know, for a shipping company. But uh, yeah, they were animated by a spirit, which unfortunately we don't quite have these days, it seems. Why did they, uh, you know, enhance the top of the building in this way? seems incomprehensible to our prosaic mentalities but the world was not always like ours and look at uh, look uh, i mean look here it's i i you know a, a so-called detail but very creative and uh, look at the brickwork This is the school of Amsterdam. And they burned or they destroyed the archive of Pete Kramer. How could this be? Because the Dutch themselves, you know, are sometimes blinded, you know, by I don't know what. Because the school of Amsterdam lost the battle with the steel, you know, they, they lost the battle with the, with a, a certain a certain kind of modernity much more abstracted or abstract. Here, there are still echoes from a certain past, but I think the, the brilliance of, of craft is uh, no one can deny. And not just the craft. I mean, look here, you have re literally, uh, you have an embroidered architecture. You know, uh, it's hard not to like something like this and not to appreciate something like this. 
And this is just one building. Uh, we are going to see other buildings. Pete Kramer, not bad. Uh, he built uh, in his later years, he built a lot of bridges above the canals of Amsterdam. So if you go to Amsterdam, many of the bridges, I mean, there are so many in Amsterdam, over the canals of, of Amsterdam are built by, I mean, conceived and built by Piet Kramer. We are going to see some of them. Now look here. Do we have a better architecture today? I am not, I'm, I don't know. I, I am not sure. Uh, this was remarkable at that time. There is artistry. There is a longing for, uh, I don't know, the infinite. If that, this sounds too emphatic or too old fashioned, let it be. But uh, I mean, look a detail. Well, I, I feel like coming back to this because I, I, I find it very impressive. Why did these people have a need to work on the glass and not leave it just just glass? But some 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 of these artists coming back. In fact, uh, uh, that uh, hotel that uh, was built by Zaha Hadid architects, uh, Zaha Hadid. Uh, you know, before she died, or uh, it was completed maybe after she died, seems to point a little bit in this direction. But using, of course, the, you know, the te technologies of today in, in terms of project, projecting, uh, parametric design and so on. At that time, there was nothing like this. Sorry about this picture. It's, I couldn't find any picture of him high resolution of this remarkable architect because he was remarkable. I mean, look here, uh, just a fragment of this building. Now, of course, he could not have done this building without a very, very, I mean, highly trained and sensitive and knowledgeable craftsmen. And look at this interest here. It has character. It is artistically endowed with the power of expression. Are our entrances in our buildings now better with their banality, just a square or a rectangle, a rectangular hole in a, in a white or grayish wall? I don't think so. Will this world come back somehow in architecture? It's possible, yes. When people will stop watching so much TV and will uh, will spend more time creating things where they can use their imagination and intelligence and, and the work of the hands as creatively as possible. So this is another, sorry, because the, the English Wikipedia is rather, you know, stingy with uh, Pete Kramer. I had to go to the Dutch Wikipedia to uh, find more information, but uh, unfortunately the language is not English, it's, uh, it's Dutch. But we understand he worked with Michel de Klerk, 1919-1922, and look at this block of flats apartment building who would do such an apartment building today nobody but they did it and this is social housing these are inexpensive block of flats this this was almost like a you know kind of a socialist architecture in a, a you know capitalist country at that time this were for poor people for underprivileged people social housing but look at it. Maybe Guillaume Apollinaire, of whom I, uh, you know, from whom I read last night, was right when he was advocating the cause of, a, um, you know, uh, 
I sounded better in Romanian. I'm trying to translate from Romanian into English. Architecture inutile, uh, you know, useless architectures, because it was the claim of, of Guillaume Apollinaire that the great arch architectures of the world were in good measure useless. He said, you know, a grave doesn't have a tomb, doesn't have to be a pyramid. Uh, I mean, that huge pyramid is in, in you know, in, most of it is useless. In as much as you say, this is useless. You know, what is its function? Why did um, there is a sculpture here? Why did uh, Pete Kramer and uh, Michel de Clerc make this building an apartment building in this way? Because of the need for expression. And you could say, well, expression is useless. It's not useless. We express our soul. And that's what actually Guillaume Apollinaire was pointing towards that what appears to be useless, often it is not useless. It has a function. Even John Ruskin said that, you know, the, the most beautiful things in the world in nature are actually useless. And he mentioned the flamboyant uh, uh, tail of the peacock and the lily. So if nature, you know, was uh, exuberant in its uh, own need or in her own need for expression, why shouldn't we? So maybe what will save architecture will be the, the uselessness of architecture. The so-called useless elements of architecture will save architecture. Otherwise, we'll die of boredom in the name of so-called functionalism, which reduces architecture to a depressing uh, uh, prose. I love this building by Michel de Klerk and, and Piet Kramer, really. And if you arrive in Amsterdam, please go and see it and see other buildings by both architects because they are there. I saw them. Just look at this, a uh, block of flats, social housing. They were very inspired and inspiring. And it's not just this building, there are others. This is one of them. Sorry about the resolution, but look at this. You feel like your heart is beating harder and quicker. Yes, uh, this is the role of art. And this is not really about a patella bourgeoisie like in the case of Kov Himmelblau or maybe even Votruba. No, it's an architecture, an expressive architecture. That's why the School of Amsterdam is considered, you know, uh, part of the the expressionist movement. It's artistry. That's what it is. It is artistry. At that time, the architect still considered himself or herself an artist. And there's nothing wrong with that. Otherwise, again and again, will die of boredom. I mean, even this service interest, because it seems like a service interest. Look at the Look at the windows, you know, they are not identical. There is an asymmetry here. This is a little, you know, like a portion of the endless column by Brancusi here. Uh, and then look at this window that is crafted to marry itself with the, with the you know, the, the fragment from the endless column by Brancusi. <laughs> this is creation. That's what it is. It is creation. And the roof is creation, not of that building. Uh, there are many. It's, it's actually a, a complex of buildings, of apartment buildings. As you can see, they were all designed. Sorry about this disturbing Alami, but they take nice pictures, but then they destroy them with the splashing the name all over it in, name, in the name of authorship. They ruin their own work. They are ridiculous. So all these buildings were designed by Pete Kramer and um, Michel de Klerk. Not bad. Not bad at all. I particularly like this view in this, 
you know, maybe uh, the sunset light. Now, uh, what is this? Um, another, the, ah, yes, I remember. In 1916, 1918, um, uh, manufacturer, I think, of ceramic tiles invited the young architects, some young architects in the Netherlands, to build uh, some houses in a park that, you know, he acquired. So let's read about this. The park was created on the initiative of the Amsterdam tile dealer, Arnold Heisted, uh, in the difficult years of the First World War. Heisted commissioned uh, this person, Stahl, whom he knew from the archi Architectura et Amicitia Society, and approached four young architects to work with, Margaret Kop Kropholer, his later wife, Cornelis, uh, whatever, Guillaume Lacroix, and Pete Kramer. Hasty gave them complete freedom in building 17 country houses on a specially purchased plot in Bergen. Seven detached, two double, and two three-part villas. The only condition was that they would make ample use of, of Hasty's styles in the interiors. All villas were built between 1917 in 1918. Uh, I think uh, he built several buildings, but, but they were not preserved. I will show though, I think one or two that were preserved, done by Pete Kramer. Uh, this is one of them. And you see it's an architecture, uh, you know, indeed very, very opposite to what, uh, you know, the steel, for example, promoted. You know, Riedveld, uh, Mondrian was a painter, and Theo van Dersburg. But this was the other side of, uh, of the, the architectural climate in the Netherlands. And it's remarkable that around that, the same time, you had such different divergent visions about architecture, about the visual culture. Bravo to them. There was a richness of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, movements in architecture and uh, experiments and so on. Pete Kramer, architect. Then uh, <clears throat> this one, uh, which is itself very, very uh, charming in a way, in a kind of a traditional, traditionalist way. We are going to see an even more uh, uh, whimsical and charming one um, very soon. Interesting experiment. Uh, give freedom to the architects and to artists, and you'll be then uh, rewarded. Give them freedom, both in school and out of school. That's what, that's what I would say. As it is written on the elevation of the secessionist building built by Maria Olbrich in Vienna, to each age its art and to art its freedom. Unfortunately, there are so many people who are against this. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I thought I, I probably have another another presentation with more pictures from this park, but maybe the one by Pete Kramer was just uh, the previous one and this one. Anyway, now it's another uh, apartment building, uh, you know, social housing by Pete uh, Pete Kramer. Uh, I mean, look what's going on here at the top. You know, uh, event, events, eventful uh, happenings. You know, architecture, architecturally eventful. A uh, bravo to him. Pete Kramer, loving brick. And brick does deserve our affection. Affection which should never, which should never allow brick to be covered with, I don't know what, plaster or I don't know. No, in the name of, uh, of protecting it. No, A brick doesn't want to be protected, meaning, meaning hidden. Brick wants to be exposed with its beauty. Now, as I said, in his later years, he didn't build any longer so-called buildings. He built bridges. But some technical uh, spaces or buildings near the bridges, and you'll see that some of them are very artistically endowed. This is the bridge number 400, 
by Piet Kramer for 1921 um, in Amsterdam, of course. Um, this is a newer bridge. Uh, another one, he built many. Uh, but the, look at this one. This one was for around, from around that time. What is this building here? I, I find it very intriguing. You know, I, I don't know exactly what it is. Maybe some kind of a technical space, you know. Uh, but, but, but it's not banal. Or this one, you know, is it the same one? Maybe it is the same from the other side, uh, although it looks a little bit different. Very creative, no? But again, give freedom to the artist, to the architects, or to the artist in the architect. Give them freedom. Trust them. Look at this one. It's like a mask, you know, with the two eyes here, you know, maybe, you know, some inspiration coming from, I don't know, Teutonic times or Africa. And it's, it's just a technical space, but it has character. It has, it's mysterious. It's intriguing. They're staring at me right now through those two windows. Pete Kramer. Bravo to him. And then look here. Why did he complicate himself here? As if searching for beauty is a complication. It is, but it's a, it's a very useful uh, use, uselessness. Let's fight for the, use, the, 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 the usefulness of the uselessness. Let's fight for it. But this is also useless, no? I mean, he could have he could have done it straight. Now, why did he complicate himself and also complicate the work of the of the of the craftsman? Bridges, bridges, and again that um, mask building. Maybe John Hayda could have liked it too, although the architectonic expression is very different from what uh, John Haydock liked. He liked more the, the steel movement. Theo van Duisburg and, and Mondrian, not uh, Michael de Klerk and Piet, Piet uh, Kramer. What is this? Another uh, housing, uh, but a little bit later, 1923, another social housing complex, you know, uh, apartment buildings for, uh, for the not rich. And back to the earlier work, or maybe done around that time. Uh, maybe he was still working with Michel de Klerk. All these works are done in Amsterdam. Um, what is this? Ah, this is a, that uh, is a famous actually department store, uh, a mall, a mall he built, but I don't know if he still exists. Uh, it, it escaped the bombing, I think, I think, but I think it was demolished, if I'm not wrong, which is sad, of course, built by Pete Kramer. Yeah, I think this picture was taken after the war, but I think the building does not exist any longer. I hope I'm wrong. Yes, this is <laughs> welcome to today's world, in a way, in a in a less uh, extravagant way, but anyway, uh, we saw this picture, but this is a better resolution. And uh, back to the housing uh, for, uh, for the uh, lovers of uh, whimsicality and architecture, look at this window here. Why did he make this window in this way? What is the logic, Mr. Kramer? Could you please explain to us before we reject your project? Why did you... Why do you bother to create this uh, entrance with these uh, useless things? Why, why did you create this window here, which is so useless itself? You know, why did you make it in this way? Why didn't you just use a, you know, a typical window? Why, why, why is it not flat? Why, Mr. Kramer, why? Uh, why did you do this above? Really, <clears throat> uh, you should stop with these eccentricities. Uh, 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 look at this window. 
Why, Mr. Kramer? Another bridge, Brook number 381. No pictures. Uh, what, what is this? I don't know what it is. Yeah, sorry. My, my presentation is not as logical as it should be. Uh, another block of flats by Pete Kramer. Uh, what is this? A patisserie. You know what that is. Um, you know, he took all kinds of jobs. Since, uh, post, since uh, the school of Amsterdam fell out of fashion, it was difficult for him to, to find commissions. So he designed patisseries and, and bridges all over Amsterdam. He tried to survive as an architect in difficult times. Ah, I wish I, I had some of those sweets. Uh, what, with me here, what is this? 1929, another bridge, 43, uh, Amsterdam again. Uh, what is this? Another bridge, 1926, 1927. Uh, the more we advanced in uh, towards uh, our time, the more the bridges became less uh, interesting uh, architect architectural. Uh, and uh, of course, they became wider to accommodate cars and so on. Uh, what is this? Ah, this is another housing uh, complex, uh, different from what we saw previously, but still Pete Kramer. Lots of beautiful bicycles. The Dutch bicycles are, are great. Um, it's the same complex, actually. Another bridge, more romantic in a way, more uh, looking towards the Middle Ages in a certain way, uh, and another villa. Uh, this one perhaps not so interesting, but it was built. And uh, what is this? Uh, I think a monument. No, uh, we'll arrive at a monument. It's still some kind of a housing, uh, another bridge. Sorry about this uh, meandering through his uh, later works. Yes, the national monument for, I don't know what, 1934, it was not for, uh, you know, uh, something eventful in the Second World War, it was prior to that time, but uh, humanity doesn't uh, miss any occasion to have another war or some kind of a conflict. Here it is, a monument by Pete Kramer. I still like more uh, his uh, social housing, uh, uh, complexes and that uh, shipping um, house that he built at the very beginning when he was very young. Uh, I guess he designed also this uh, sphere, but it's a sculpture, of course. Another bridge, more modern. When was it built? 1942. So what do you expect? Um, closer to us, closer to our own modernity, 1947. Uh, welcome to, almost welcome to contemporary times. You see, it's a change. It's a change. Less craft, less so-called complications, more useful things. That's it. Let's, uh, let's, uh, I don't know, we cannot say happy birthday because he died on the 4th of, of February, but on his birthday, we'll talk again about him and I will, uh, I will try to improve my presentation. Thank you for being here.